Hi, I'm Larry Black, and today we're looking back. About 20 years ago, I had an idea to get a room filled with country music people, singers, songwriters, put together 30 of them. They love to tell stories. They love to share with each other. And today, they get to share with you. This is Looking Back with Larry Black. Hey, you've done it again. You showed up for Looking Back. Today is another special day. As much as I like the songs, I love the stories. This one is about Ernest Tubb, seen from two perspectives. One is Johnny Paycheck and then Jack Green. You will absolutely have your heart touched with this. Johnny, you had a story. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't have many, but, uh, <laughs> but I have one. Ernest. Uh, <laughs> yeah. There's many I can tell, but uh, uh, Ernest, uh, one time uh, I was hanging around the streets and it was snowing and uh, uh, Buddy Emmons took me on to meet him. I always wanted to meet him and uh, I had met him, but I mean I wanted to sit and talk with him. And they was getting ready to go on tour and I didn't have anywhere to stay, you know. I was at that stage in my life and evidently Buddy had told him that because we got on, he said, I talked to him a while and I was, you know, and he said, well, it's about time to leave. He said, uh, he said, are you working? Asked me if I was working. I said, no. He said, you are now. <laughs> he was going on like 10 days out in Texas and it was snowing here in Nashville and I had nowhere to, you know, I just, I was in that, in that place where I was, you know. He took me on the road Wound up giving me a suit. I didn't have nothing to wear, so he gave me one of his old suits and took it to the cleaners and I had it cut down the first date we got in Texas. And it was so, the, there was two pockets in the back. That's how much I, I had to take up. But I, it was a, and, and I still got a picture of me in, 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 in that suit. And uh, I, I, he let me go out and I opened his show for him for 10 days. And uh, he fed me and at the end of the tour gave me some money. So that's the kind of guy he was. Jack, talk about Ernest because you started out as the drummer in um, in Ernest Tubbs band. Well, you know, we uh, just the other night we were telling road stories about ET, and so many people have been influenced by Ernest and also helped by Ernest. So many people like Stonewall Jackson and all all the guys that he took on the road. Uh, he would always take other people out and give them part of his money and uh, give them motel rooms and a place to go and a ride. And, like you said, he even gave him his clothes sometimes. But Ernest was uh, probably the uh, most important instrument on the Grand Ole Opry that kept it going and, and uh, give new people a chance to be heard. Cal Smith and myself and uh, many other people are examples of that. And, uh, but he was, a, he was the kindest, most giving man I've ever met in my life. And uh, he knew how to pick a good song and he knew what the folks liked and uh, one night we were sitting on the bus in Detroit, Michigan. It was an afternoon. This family came up and said, Ernest, we just wanted to say hello. We'd like to go see your show, but we don't have the money. So he went around to the front and bought eight tickets for the whole family to come in and see the show. And he was just that kind of guy. He always wanted to help so many people. And, and uh, he carried Linda Flanagan on the bus. and. Skeeter Davis and many other people to give him chances to be heard. And uh, he's probably the most important figure, one individual in this whole music industry called Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, hey, Jack, you, you, you were saying what a compassionate, kind man Ernest Tubb was. He kicked you off the bus one night. <laughs> that was the other Ernest. <laughs> uh, you and Cal Smith, right? Yeah, Cal and I both uh, got off the same night. Uh, <laughs> what had you My done? My request. My request. Yeah. <laughs> no, uh, and also there's something great come out of that. Uh, Ernest had those times. I don't know. It was a certain cities we'd go to that uh, he had to get in the bottle. I don't know whether it was bad memories or whatever it was, but we could tell on it. If we went to Washington D.C., he was on one. And uh, uh, this particular night, we had three days to do, and the first night, the Troubadours did their first set, and we extended it a little bit and took a break, and then we went back and did another set, and extended that one a little bit and took a break, and went back and did another, another set, 
And uh, so uh, Jack Drake said, well, boys, it's over. Let's go back home. So uh, we got in the bus going back to the house. And uh, Cal Smith had uh, had an altercation with Ernest on the bus before we pulled out. I never did know what it was about because I was loading my drums up. But I heard Cal say, son, you don't slap me. I ain't going to go for that. And uh, so he got the car with somebody else and went to the airport. And uh, so uh, we were riding down through Virginia, and Ernest come up and sat down beside me and on the outside seat where I couldn't get out. And he said, son, I want to talk to you about your problems. <laughs> <laughs> and I did have a lot of problems. <laughs> I had wife problems, I had money problems, and I had kid problems and everything else. But being on the road 300 days a year and trying to support a family back home and put kids through school uh, is a little tough. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he, he kind of rubbed me the wrong way that night. And I said, Ernest, I can handle my problems, but you got one you can't handle. And he said, well, when we get back to Nashville, you no longer work for Ernest Tub. I said, well, I don't have to get back to Nashville. I can get off here. He said, stop the bus. <laughs> <laughs> So I got, I got off of the bus, and it was a two-lane highway down through Virginia, and I started walking. I still had, I still had on my rhinestone suit. <laughs> the brown ones with the red in it, and the, the bell bottoms and the white boots and all that. Can you see that walking down through the hills of Virginia? <laughs> anyway, the bus kept running along beside me. You know, Johnny Wiggins kept saying, get back on, Jackie. It's all, it's all right. Get back on. I said, no, I'm through. And uh, so they kept... Tell me to get back on. Well, they had, I found out later they had a $100 bet <laughs> with Ernest that I would not get back on. And he bet them 100 that I would. Well, I didn't know about that. But anyway, I got to the next town. I walked to the next town, which was about 18 or 19 miles. And there was a little all-night diner there called the Blue, Blue Something Diner. And uh, so I went in there and asked the lady. I said, is there a bus that goes by here? She said, yeah, it comes by at 6 o'clock in the morning. I said, good, if you don't mind, I'll just drink coffee until they get here. So uh, and it was about midnight then. So I waited, and the bus finally pulled up, and I got up there and asked the guy how much it was to, not, to uh, Nashville, and he said $25. And I said, I've only got 15 I said, uh, can you get me to Knoxville? And about that time, somebody slapped me in the back of the head and said, I'll loan you $10. It was Cal. <laughs> He'd got on the bus back in D.C. <laughs> I got on the Virginia. So <laughs> we, we, made our, we made our plans all the way back to Nashville. We talked about what we was going to do. No way would we ever go back to Ernest. You know, we was going to go out on our own and all that. And we swore to each other we wouldn't go back. Well, we got to Nashville. He called us and said, come down. And we told him we wasn't going to go back. Anyway, he said, well, just come down. We'll talk about it. Do the opera with me, and we'll talk about it. So, okay, we went down, and we did the opera, and we never did talk about it, and we stayed three more years. <laughs> <laughs> well, the greatest thing that came out of it is yeah. uh, artist told us he'd never d take another drop. And uh, he told me years and years later that on the way home from the opera one night, he stopped and uh, bought a six-pack on the way home, but he never opened it. So uh, he won, and all all the all the things that went through to uh, to to bring that story true, and me and Cal got out on our own, and well, we stayed a little bit while longer, but he helped both of us start our careers, and uh, encouraged us all the way through, and made sure that the the Opry took care of us, and, and all that. And uh, but his the the most important thing that came out of it, he said, "Boys, if you'll come back, I'll never take another drop." And so that was the best thing that ever happened out of all of that. Yeah. Hey, y'all know one of the greatest ballad singers in the world is sitting right over there in the corner, our buddy Jack Green. Jack, what would we have to do to get you to sing for us? I'll just kick it off. That's all you have to do. <laughs> well, talk to Mr. Dickens. He's in charge of the band today. But it's in A, boys, and, and uh, this is one that was called Name It After Me for a long time. <laughs> and we retitled it and rearranged it, and now it's called Statue of a Fool. Boys, do it. Do it, ready? I can't sing it sitting down. Somewhere there should be 
for all the world to see a statue of a fool made of stone the image of a man who let love Just let him stand there all alone There on his face a gold tear should be placed to honor the million tears. He's cried, and the hurt in his eyes would show. So everyone would know, concealed is a broken heart inside. Sung that song, but nobody sings it quite like Jack Green does. Was the original name of that "Name It After Me"? Name it after me, and it was in a up tempo. Oh, really? Yeah. Somewhere that should be for all the world to see. I still got the demo. It's it's funny. I think you were smart to slow it down. <laughs> well, I carried it to the session every time we go to do a recording session. I'd take that song, and Owen Bradley didn't like the title, and he didn't like the arrangement, and we were hung on a. Session one time, we'd already tried three songs and nothing was coming off. So he said, what's that old song you've been trying to get me to record all these years? I said, I'll go get the tape. He said, no, I don't want the tape. I want you to stand here and sing it for me. So I sung it and he said, okay, take a break. And all the musicians left the studio and uh, about 15 minutes later, he said, okay, come on back in. This is the way it goes. Da, 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 da. Wow. So he gave new life to it. And when we got it recorded, he said, what do you want to call this thing? I said, well, whatever you want to call it. He said, how about Statue of a Fool? I said, that's good. Let's do that. So, uh, you know, I took it in there for many, many times, and he never did like it because it wasn't in the right tempo and it had the wrong title. Now, aren't you glad you stopped in for that? Listen, come back again. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button. And remember to remember. <laughs>